everybody! Welcome to our Halloween episode, The Strange and the Haunting. Today us humans are going to have a lot of fun, so please stay tuned for all sorts of... Oh my goodness! Somebody call the police, call the fire department, call Tom Vassal, tell him I can't make... Sorry about that, folks. Just a little interference. Before we get to our show, I want to give a big thanks to Jennifer Reed for supporting us. She makes this wonderful human broadcast all the better. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, everybody, here we go. The Strange and the Haunting. Hello, friends of The Blend. As Juval here, Halloween is almost upon us, and hey, who really gets scared during Halloween? Not this guy. Who turned out the lights? Who's there? Huh? Who said that? Wait a minute. Gotta get a flashlight. I know there's one around here somewhere. Ow! Here it is. What? What happened? Who's there? Hello? What's going on? Is anybody in here? Wait a minute. What about all my games? Holy crap! <laughs> hey, I said go. Hello? You can start now. That was weird. Anyway, here we go. Shrieks and Creeks, published in 1988 by Golden. This is a two to four player game in which you're trying to escape a haunted house. It also includes a talking tombstone. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. The first thing you need to do is insert the cassette tape into your cassette player. Good luck in trying to find one. Once you have done that, you push play and the cassette tape will continuously run throughout the game. Now, here is the starting space. The first player will go ahead and roll a six-sided dice and move along the black circles here. He can go either direction. Once you hit a black cat, then you will take your player key along with a room key and insert it into the tombstone. Now, if you hear a noise like this, that means that the room is haunted. You have to wait for instructions to see what you need to do. Quit monkeying around. The gorilla has escaped. Go to the dungeon and try to coax him back into his cage. If you need help, just yell. Go to the dungeon. So whatever the host instructs you to do, you have to do that. Usually it's moving backwards instead of forwards. So once you have did what you were instructed to do, it's the next player's turn. And then he moves along the black circles. Now remember, not every key combination will have the same effect. So you just kind of have to feel it out. The first player to successfully traverse the maze and get to the finish space and gets out of the building wins the game. What a fun game to pull out during Halloween time where the whole family can get together and play. Just one important thing to note is that it is difficult to find one with the tape actually still working. But if you can find it, it's great fun. Well, that's all that... That wasn't a dream? That was real? Oh my gosh. Hey, may your rules be high. Boards and Crafts, a place where spooks and scares inspire from games, board games, and all about board games. When most people think about Halloween, they think about ghosts and ghouls, scary skeletons, wicked werewolves, and vicious vampires that are out for blood. 
Bob referred the tales that involve serial killers, magical scientists, and beings that with one look will make you insane. That's right, I'm talking about the tales from the silly name king himself, H.P. Lovecraft. One of my favorite games that's inspired by his tales is Arkham Horror. This game is fantastic, but it's playtime. It's, it's always so long that we have to take a snack break. So I took up the challenge to create a snack that's out of this world. So let's party like it's 1926 and create ourselves some clear token cookies. The ingredients that you'll need for these cookies are as follows. You'll need some flour, baking powder, salt, butter, sugar, an egg, vanilla extract, and food coloring. Preheat the oven for 325 degrees Fahrenheit. In a large bowl, mix two cups of flour, a half teaspoon of baking powder, and a fourth teaspoon of salt. In another bowl, add a half cup of unsalted butter, one cup of sugar, an egg, and a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Gradually add the flour mixture until it's combined with the other mixture in the bowl and mix in the dye. Separate the dough out into spoonfuls and make little round shapes out of it. Place the cookies onto a non-stick cookie sheet or baking sheets lined with parchment. While baking, rotate the cookies halfway through and let it bake for 10 to 18 minutes depending on what size you bake them. Let it cool on the wire racks and then after they are finally chill enough, ice the cookies. But wait! There's more! If you decide to change the food coloring dye to be blue instead of green, you can change these into elder sign cookies instead, like these right here. Thank you, Harvey. If you guys have any ideas for tasty treats or creative crafts, comment below or tweet them at me at ArtsyRobot. Now I'm off to feed these to some elder gods. It's Maggie Vaught here from Board Game Blender, and when I thought of a Halloween episode, I thought, what are the scariest mechanics I can think of? Blind bidding. <laughs> and because the big difference between Halloween and a lot of other types of holidays is that Halloween's gonna drag out your non gaming friends. The very few of them that I do have probably want to know what all the fuss is about. The difference between this and Monopoly or Risk or Roll and Move. It's hard to describe without overwhelming someone. So the biggest thing that I can do is try and find something mechanically interesting, different, but I could start it without maybe explaining all the rules and show them there's a whole nother world out there. What I like to use for that is Mortimer Rosa. Mortimer Rosa is a funky little Zoc game from a couple years ago. And this game uses a little cube tower. So in this hotel, there are two victims, these red cubes. At the beginning of the game, you're gonna drop the cubes into the tower and try and listen to where they land. Obviously that one landed all the way onto the table and it would get redone. But most of the victims will fall somewhere in between. And then clues for each player playing will get dropped into the tower as well. So the first half of the game is going to be trying to find those victims and place them onto the board. So that's this. Finding a victim lets you reshuffle where all the clues went. Accusing a floor of having a victim when there isn't one makes it where you're the guilty party for a sloppy investigation and you have to put another of your own player cube into the tower all over again. The second half of the game, after you've found the victims and put them onto the board, you've got all those clues shifting around in there. And the second half is going to be accusing other players or hiding your own evidence. And that just says that I believe I'm gonna find a yellow cube in tower five. Yellow is not my color. I did find a yellow cube. So that would go out onto the board. The more cubes you have on the board, the worse you are, especially if those are in the same spot on the board as one of the victims. The least suspicion at the end of the game wins. Now, as I said, you really only have to explain this game a couple steps at a time because one half doesn't really talk to the other half. There is some strategy in it once you've played it a bunch of times and knowing where everyone is, but in general, the cubes are gonna move around so many times that you're not gonna be able to memorize it.
It's fun and funky and different and very horror themed, right? Or maybe not horror, but murder is pretty scary. Yeah, maybe a stretch, but I'll see y'all next time. Bye. Hey everybody, welcome to the Quirky Game. This time we are taking a look at the Bloody Inn. In the Bloody Inn, the mechanisms really are not that quirky. It's the theme that's quirky. <laughs> in it, you are running an inn. But, you know, putting people up just does not pay that much. However, killing them, taking everything in their pockets, and then burying the body, that pays some good cash. So, that's what you're doing in the Bloody Inn. You are welcoming guests. You are taking them into your hand sometimes. You can use their special powers or you can just kill them. Take all that money. Bury them before the cops catch you because if they do, then you're going to be in trouble paying the undertaker a hefty sum so that they'll hide the evidence. You keep doing this. At the end of the game, whoever has the most money is the winner, like in real life. And messing with your opponents just a little bit is a good idea. I really like this one. I know it's just coming out now, but I think it's a really neat card game. It's nothing revolutionary, but I really like the theme. I think it's nice and bloody. I love the artwork. I love everything about this one. If this is your kind of Halloween game, if you want something with a nice atmosphere, but it's still a good game mechanics-wise, then I recommend you check this one out. The Bloody Inn. Look into it, folks. You just might be charmed by it. <laughs>
guys, Tiff here, and it's my favorite time of the year. Time to bust out all of my spooky, creepy, and monstrous games. My board game club kids love Halloween time too, but it can be tricky to find games that fit that theme, but aren't too horrifying or inappropriate for school. Luckily, there are a few games that fit the bill, and one of them is Fearsome Floors. Fearsome Floors is more of an abstract type movement game, but the theme is perfect for kids at Halloween. It's a kooky monster movie wherein you're trying to sneak your team across the fortress of the monster, avoiding him and your treacherous opponents to make it through to the exit. You start off by creating the monster from a variety of pieces. You can make it as silly or as traditional as you like, a feature the kids definitely appreciate. Once constructed, the monster is placed at the exit of the fortress, and the player characters are placed in their starting spots at the opposite corner. Depending on how many players you have, the game plays up to seven, you get either three or four characters in your team. Each team has a fun theme, and the Addams Family inspired characters are a crowd favorite. Every character token will have numbers printed on either side indicating how many spaces that character can move on their turn. The players take turns moving their tokens across the floor, possibly sliding through pools of blood, pushing columns, or even moving into teleporters. At the end of the turn, each token will flip to the other side, showing the number the character can move on the next turn. These two numbers always add up to 7, so a token with 2 will flip to a 5. Once the players have taken their turns, the monster moves. His movement is determined by drawing one of the monster movement tiles, which range from 5 to 10. After each move, he'll look ahead, left, then right, and will change directions to move towards the nearest character. If the monster lands on your token, it is eaten and moved back to the starting space, or if it's the second phase, removed from the game entirely. The game can end one of two ways. Either all of the characters have exited or have been eaten by the monster, in which case the player with the most escaped characters would win, or one of the players is the first to get all but one of their characters out of the fortress. Fearsome Floors is a great game for a young board game club. Its rules are simple and quick to explain, but it requires clever planning and spatial reasoning to win. It's both fun and engaging, plus the difficulty is scalable by adding in special tiles or even an extra monster. The theme evokes a good old-fashioned Scooby-Doo style monster chase, so it always makes it to the table when October rolls around. Check it out, and I'll see you back next time. Howdy gamers, it's time once again for Buy, Try, or Deny. I'm Indiana John. Well, the Halloween episode of Board Game Blender is upon us, and it's a tricky one for me because I gotta say that Halloween is like my least favorite holiday of all. Uh, I'm not really a fan of horror movies or scary stuff. I don't really like ghouls and ghosts. I don't really like to get dressed up in a costume. And, uh, well, you know, candy I can get behind, but that's really pretty much it. Um, but there are a lot of games out there that fit this sort of Halloween theme with uh, ghouls and ghosts and monsters and horror and that kind of stuff. So I've picked three games that you might find at a Halloween gaming party. So without further ado, let the tricks and the treats begin. Some would say that the zombie theme is very overplayed in games, uh, but with the popularity of TV shows like The Walking Dead and movies like World War Z, zombies are still a big thing. 
Our buy game this time is the first zombie game that I ever played, which is The Last Night on Earth from Flying Frog Productions. This is actually the debut game by Flying Frog, and uh, featured a, a couple of real interesting things in it that I hadn't seen in other games. Uh, the main one being this photographic artwork where instead of uh, having artists draw pictures, they actually hired actors and had them dress up and uh, take pictures, and that was all the artwork in the game. So it gives it a cool sort of campy B-movie feel, which I think is a whole lot of fun. Um, you're uh, walking around around, uh, you know, taking on roles like Jenny, the farmer's daughter, and Johnny, the high school quarterback. And you're walking around trying to find items to combat these zombies. You have a scenario card that you're trying to uh, complete certain objectives. This is Die Zombies Die, where you have to kill a certain number of zombies. There's even a uh, scenario where you have to try to escape in a pickup truck, but you have to find the keys and get some fuel for the truck. And it's very thematic and an awful lot of fun. So you have players controlling the zombies and then players controlling each of the human characters as well. The game also is one of the first ones I've seen that came with a music soundtrack of original music that you could play in the background during the game. It's not the best music in the world, but it's a real ambitious thing to uh, have included in the game, and I thought it was a cool thing. So um, there are lots of other zombie games out there. Of course, Dead of Winter is one recently that has been uh, wildly popular. Uh, but for my money, uh, the buy for this time is Last Night on Earth. Today's try game is a horror re-theming of a classic kids game, and that is Run For Your Life Candyman from Smirk and Dagger Games. This is actually kind of a re-theming of Candyland, where you play a gingerbread man who's found out that this candy kingdom isn't all it's cracked up to be, and that the uh, candy is actually getting shipped off uh, to children around the world to be eaten, and you're not going out like that. So you're playing a gingerbread man who's trying to escape. Uh, there's combat rules where you're trying, where you're attacking each other, and you have you keep track of your life total on this little uh, score sheet here, where there's little boxes for each of your limbs, and as each limb gets destroyed and fill, completely filled up, you actually tear that limb off of the sheet of paper. So it's terrific fun. It's a real light game, and it's definitely not one that has a whole lot lot of uh, deep strategy to it. But uh, for a light sort of party environment, maybe get some non-gamers uh, involved, uh, it's a fun one. My wife really, really enjoys this game. And so I would recommend you give a try to run for your life, Candyman. Today's Deny game is one that I don't have in my collection anymore. I used to own it and I actually backed it on Kickstarter when it first came out. And that is Till Dawn, which is a uh, vampire themed press your luck game. Uh, which is, comes in a really cool coffin-shaped box. I did a review of this game on the Dice Tower YouTube channel, so you can check that out if you want to, and I probably gave it a bit of a higher recommendation than I am giving it now. Um, I found that as a press your luck game, it was very, very random, and even though the theme sort of came through and you're trying to get blood tokens, um, but you're not, you know, you're trying to get as many of those as you can before the sun comes up and you as a vampire have to get back into your coffin. Uh, so the idea of it's pretty good, but I found that it was very random, very swingy, you didn't have a whole lot of control or even a good understanding of how the press your luck w uh, worked, so that it was really difficult to make any meaningful decisions. So, uh, so that one was just kind of a deny for me, although it really had cool components and a really neat shaped box. So there you have it, my fellow Halloweenies. Our deny game, Till Dawn. Our try game, Run For Your Life Candyman. And our excellent buy game, Last Night on Earth. So have fun trick-or-treating, stay safe out there, and until next time, game on. Hey folks, for today's Under the Radar segment, I am flying really low. I am going way under the radar, and I'm going to be talking about an old trading card game called The Nightmare Before Christmas. This is a, uh, like I said, a collectible card game that was designed by Andrew Parks and Zeth Schlesinger, who uh, you might know as uh, Z-Man, right, from Z-Man Games. And uh, he worked with Andrew Parks to design this neat, interesting, and different trading card game. See, to me, trading card games a lot of them do feel like, a lot of them do feel like they've taken Magic the Gathering and kind of put a spin on that. But this game always felt very interesting and unique to me. It did not do what Magic the Gathering did. And in fact, it felt more complete than that game, which is probably not a good thing when you are putting together a collectible card game, right? Because in this game, once my deck was done, for example, and I was really happy with my deck, this is a... This is my uh, my sleeved deck, by the way, Old Faithful here. 
then at the point I was done building this deck and I was really, really happy with it, I kind of didn't need to find any more cards because the, uh, the game, the design was such a non-TCG game, you know. Uh, and, and again, that might be a bad thing when you're going for a collectible card game, but I thought it made this game really strong. And in fact, you can see in it shades of Andrew Park's later, later games, like uh, Core World has in it ideas that I, I can see in this game. The idea here is you take a character, one of the many characters from the movie, and you are building your own town, your own Halloween town. And uh, you're going to play over 12 rounds, I believe it is. You are flipping over locations. You are deploying characters to those locations. You are managing your pumpkin points, which is a resource you gather throughout the game and then spend each round picking and choosing what locations end up in your Halloween town. And so you could have something like the town square. The town square here adds four pumpkin points. And that could be the one action you triggered. Of course, you need to have enough characters there that the town is fulfilled. And so the points here at the top let you know how many characters you've got to have there. That's the general flow of the game. It plays with two or more players. I've, uh, I think I've enjoyed it mostly with two players. And the game is just, I mean, for a while there, man, I played this game all the time. I absolutely love it. I think it's a wonderful trading card game that if you like this theme at all, then on top of getting a good game, you're getting a great theme. And yeah, the theme and the game, there's a little bit of a stretch there, but you gotta check this one out if you like Nightmare Before Christmas, and if you're okay with, you know, buying some old um, TCG cards on the cheap, you know, because the game clearly has been cancelled many years ago. So, there you go, that is my uh, game for Under the Radar. The Nightmare Before Christmas trading card game, I think is fantastic. I know uh, it clearly doesn't get a whole lot of love, but you should check it out anyway. Oogie Boogie! Boop, 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 boop. I can't do it with such a tiny box. Boop, 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 boop. to the carnival where there are zombies we are talking about designer spotlight with Matteo Santos who designed a great game called Carnival Zombie this is a co-op game where you can play with your friends you could all come you have strange creatures strange clowns and killer creatures coming after you and you work together to Save the town from these nasty creatures. If you are looking for a great game with zombies and crazy clowns like me, come to the carnival, the carnival of zombies, and play Matteo Santos's great game of carnival zombie. This is another designer spotlight. So that spooky day of days is coming up and you'd like to play some board games, but you're just not sure which ones to play. Well, let me give you some suggestions in board games meet dot 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 Halloween. Let's say you've got the time and you want a cool story and lots of theme, but it's got to have an awesome story. In that case, I think nothing out there beats Betrayal at House on the Hill. This one, you gotta read the cards, you gotta get into that theme. You have to roleplay your character, and yeah, the game's gonna break down on you sometimes, but you're gonna walk away with an awesome story to tell. How about you still want good theming, but you want something more robust, better mechanisms, more development? Fury of Dracula is the one for you. 
In this one, you are going to go on the hunt, looking for that fiend, or play the fiend himself. And hey, they just came out with version 3.0 of this one, so go scoop that up. Let's say you want something fast and dirty, and you love chucking dice, and hey, zombies couldn't hurt. In that case, what you're looking for is run, fight, or die. In this one, you are competing with your opponents, and all you gotta do is not be the slowest, right? This is a great Yahtzee-style chuck and dice kind of game, and well, if Sam was here, he'd tell you all about it, so this one's in your honor, Sammy. Let's bring it down to something simpler, not quite as thematic, but still not a filler. I'm talking about Broom Service. This is a great family game, it's got a cute theme that works with just about everybody, and this is gonna go over really well with a mixture of gamers and non-gamers. I recommend you check this one out. How about you want to play a game with that special someone and they love the theater and they love literature? In that case, I recommend The Phantom of the Opera. This is a great two-player game full of mystery, full of tension, and you get to take turns being the one holding all the cards. Check this one out. A really neat deduction puzzly game. And lastly, how about you want just a little filler, something to put in your pocket on the way to that Halloween party? In that case, I recommend Tricks and Treats. This is a simple, cute, perfectly themed little card game, and it's all about getting candy, but doing it in a sneaky way. You don't want people to know which basket is your basket. This is gonna go over really well at that get-together, so look into it. So there you have it, folks. Some ideas for your Halloween gaming, whether you are throwing a whole party, getting together with some friends, or just playing with that special someone, there is a game that is just right for your Halloween game night. Hi everybody! As soon as I saw that we were doing a Halloween theme show, I knew exactly what game I wanted to highlight. Ghost Blitz. I mean, ghosts are totally Halloween-y, right? Of course, the ghost in this game is really more cute than it is spooky, and it's a raucous speed and dexterity game, not an atmospheric thriller, but ghost. If you haven't played Ghost Blitz before, there's a lighthearted backstory about the house ghost named Baldwin getting a camera and taking pictures of household objects. In the box, you get a few wooden objects, each with a distinct color and a deck of cards. One downside to the game is that it's not super colorblind friendly, unfortunately. But the rules are very, very simple. A card is flipped over that depicts some of the objects, but in a mix of colors. If an object is shown in the correct color, you want to be the first one to grab that item. Conversely, if all the objects shown are in the wrong color, you want to grab the item that is not shown. The game is super quick and easy to set up and teach and is ridiculously fun. Basic Ghost Blitz is great, especially with non-gamers and families. But if you really want to up-level your ghost grabbing game, you've got to find yourself a copy of Ghost Blitz 5 for 12. The same rules of the base game apply, but now you have two objects in each color and you have additional rules that include shouting. And anyone who knows me knows... I love shouting! The extra rules in 5 for 12 are these. If there's an owl, then you need to shout out the object you would normally grab. If there's a clock and a ghost, then you need to shout out the time on the clock. It's mind-blowing. 9.30. Oh, it's stupid ghost. If there's an item reflected in a mirror, then you need to grab that item no matter the color. But if there's a mirror and an owl, then you need to shout out the color of the object shown in the mirror. Oh! It's ridiculously ridiculous. I gotta tell you, these additions make Ghost Blitz really challenging. You're sitting or standing there feeling twitchy, and every card that flips sends your brain spasming. Thankfully, you can mix and match the rules a bit to ratchet the difficulty up or down. And quick warning, if Baldwin was a vengeful ghost, its revenge surely comes in the form of finger jams and scratches as hands collide trying to snap up the same object. There you have it. Hopefully I showed you how much fun this silly game is. If you're looking for some ghostly awesomeness for a Halloween gathering or just need a fun filler or icebreaker, capture yourself a copy of Ghost Blitz. That is our Halloween show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't worry about him. I have subdued him with the power of my mind. Tune in again in two weeks, please, when we'll be talking racing games. I'm calling it Off to the Races. So come on back for that. As always, a big thank you to all my contributors. And I will see you again shortly. And as always, hey, 
Stay a friend of the bland, folks.